thank you all uh, for coming. Uh, I'm very pleased uh, to introduce uh, the ideas of transformative innovation policy as they have been developed up to now and in a very introductory way. Uh, in the next uh, period, I'm going to introduce a series of concepts, uh, try to show how those concepts fit together into a new way of thinking about innovation policy uh, and how projects and programs can be defined uh, in terms of this new uh, perspective. Okay? In order to do that, we have to build some sort of foundations and some of those foundations are departures from common understanding or prior understanding uh, drawn from innovation policy or just ordinary how do we think about the world? Because some of the ideas in transformative innovation policy, in fact, differ from conventional ways of looking at the world. We start with the world as it is. Uh, and so the first section of the five that I'll be talking about uh, is the world we are in. Uh, and then I will proceed to talk about the other uh, four topics after that. Okay, in terms of the world we are in, it's apparent that we are confronted by a series of existential threats. Uh, existential threats means threats to the future of civilization, or perhaps the world as we know it. One of these is greenhouse gas emissions, GHG. Uh, and uh, how greenhouse gases contribute to climate change. Climate change, in turn, has an impact on biodiversity. Biodiversity is a necessity uh, for human life as well as other uh, life on the planet. Uh, and ultimately, as the diagram at the bottom or the picture at the bottom shows, uh, uh, there is a question of the sea level which is particularly relevant to those of us who live on islands. Uh, because as the sea level rises, we will be living in an archipelago rather than an island. And uh, it's not only environmental issues that are constituting an uh, existential threat. We also have uh, a worsening uh, income distribution uh, within countries. It's very important not to overstate this rich running ahead of the poor uh, because in my lifetime uh, there has been a very substantial improvement in the material conditions uh, of the world's poor. Okay. So it is quite realistic now, for example, to imagine meeting the sustainable development goal, which I'll talk about in just a moment, of eradicating extreme poverty. Right? We're actually on track uh, to doing that. Uh, we're not so on track to eliminating poverty as nationally defined, which is one of the other facets of the income distribution goal. But the disparity between income and wealth uh, is uh, creating serious problems. And finally, uh, increases in waste uh, and the depletion of resources. Uh, I'm uh, more skeptical than some of my colleagues about uh, the magnitude of uh, peak, uh, whatever it is, uh, manganese, oil, whatever, uh, because uh, uh, innovation does tend to extend the resource base uh, along with exhaustion. But at the end of the day, the world is finite. Uh, and the rates of exploitation of resources are exponential. So there is a crunch at some point uh, between uh, availability uh, and use. Well, that's sort of the bad news. The good news is that there is international recognition of a number of these issues in the form of the Sustainable Development Goals. 
uh, and that these uh, have been broadly adopted as uh, uh, a desired policy by both the global north and the global south. So many governments are trying uh, to position their policies, their actions, uh, in terms uh, of the Sustainable Development Goals. Now, if you open these boxes, uh, then you'll find that there are a lot of detailed sub-goals within these goals. Uh, and the degree of, shall we say, seriousness with which people uh, are addressing the sub-goals differs across countries. But at least uh, there is a large global consensus that these are worthwhile uh, goals uh, for humanity as a whole to address. But there isn't a blueprint for attaining these goals. Okay? We have actions that we think might be relevant. They might uh, uh, take us in the direction of meeting the goals, but by no means is there a blueprint, and that is particularly uh, a problem uh, when we think about what is the nature of change that's required. And here is the first of the concepts that I uh, want to get across that varies from our ordinary understanding uh, of how technology and society uh, interact. And it's the idea of a socio-technical system. And a socio-technical system is not uh, a sector of the economy, nor is it a techno-economic system which is about a market. It's a much more expansive idea uh, that includes not only uh, the actors who are suppliers, but also those people that consume uh, goods and services within a particular area. And in fact, in that regard, it's better to start from the idea that socio-technical systems are defined by human purposes and needs. The idea of socio-technical systems uh, is meant to in include not only various things that are material, both production and consumption, but also cultural meanings and symbolic meanings uh, in these systems, socio-technical systems. So for example, uh, uh, I grew up uh, in a state uh, famous for making automobiles. Uh, and <clears throat> the state where Detroit uh, was located. Uh, uh, so uh, in my life, I've participated in automobile culture. And automobile culture had a lot of symbolic meanings, okay? Uh, automobiles as status symbols, automobiles as independence, uh, automobiles as uh, teenage sexual adventure opportunities, okay? <laughs> Uh, these were all uh, symbolic or cultural uh, meanings of the automobile. So a socio-technical system is inclusive of a variety of ways to think about how technologies and people uh, interact. Simone. Thank you very much. Given your definition of social technical systems, how many social technical systems are there? That's a question uh, uh, which has two answers. One is there are as many as you would like for the purpose of analysis. Okay. On the other hand, uh, you want to have a social technical system be sufficiently broad that you're talking about the common need or common purposes of a large number of people. Otherwise, the system aspect uh, breaks down, okay? So uh, at one point, one could talk about uh, the socio-technical uh, system of comic books. Uh, and in that case, 
it was a very narrow, uh, specific audience, age delimited, and so forth and so on. Uh, today, that's not the case. Uh, it's uh, a much broader uh, uh, system. I'd still have some problems uh, with that as a socio-technical system because separating it from other parts of publishing and other uh, leisure activities or leisure activities that people might engage in uh, is a bit of a challenge. But it depends on your purposes of analysis. So you can view society as a collection of these socio-technical systems. Uh, it, uh, and doing so emphasizes the interdependencies between human purposes, technologies, customs, and habits of thought in both supply uh, and uh, use. Uh, so an example that we use uh, of such a system is mobility. Okay. So the automobile plays a role in the socio-technical system of mobility but so does the bicycle and transport and walking. Okay. All the means to go from point A to B uh, to uh, move about are within uh, the mobility socio-technical system. And when we begin to think of uh, the problem not as an artifact, not as how uh, a machine will take you from point A to point B, but to think about human needs to move from A to B, uh, then we can think of a larger variety of solutions uh, for how mobility can be achieved. And this uh, expansion in the opportunities for addressing human needs is a key feature that a socio-technical system viewpoint brings to the table. The bottom line here is that meeting the sustainable development goals uh, is uh, something that will require a very fundamental change in the socio-technical systems that we are currently uh, employing, how they are currently constituted. And that's because we need to make uh, uh, what uh, we are calling a deep transition. And a, a deep transition in industrial times has happened once. Uh, and it largely happened uh, in this country uh, with the increasing consumption of coal as a fuel. What did coal allow? Coal allowed us to escape uh, from the current output of the sun. Insulation is a technical term for it, uh, which is uh, what the sun does in terms of bringing wind and rain, to bring windmills to make uh, grind grain, uh, uh, water to similarly grind grain and uh, use uh, uh, water power, uh, that grain to feed animals, uh, the animals uh, uh, to do mechanical work, uh, but uh, it also to feed us to do mechanical work. These are the energy sources prior to uh, the intensive use of fossil fuels. We have a little bit on the side with uh, uh, the burning of wood but if you think about it for a moment, uh, uh, wood is a relatively recent product of the sun. If the sun wasn't shining, we wouldn't have wood uh, to burn in our fireplaces. <clears throat> what fossil fuels do is allow us to consume uh, the accumulation of millions of years of human, not human, but pre-human, civilization, uh, not civilization, life on Earth, okay? So that pre-human uh, development that laid down the deposits of coal and as we later uh, exploit uh, petroleum uh, uh, provide uh, a boost. Uh, again, uh, largely that can be 
associated with uh, the ex some very substantial uh, improvement in human welfare over the past 250 years. It's very ar questionable whether uh, we would have uh, a degree of advancement that we do without having tapped into uh, fossil fuels. However, it hasn't worked out so well uh, because the burning of fossil fuels uh, contributes to the greenhouse gas uh, burden uh, and ultimately is responsible for the climate change uh, existential threat that I discussed a moment ago. So when I say that the world needs to have fundamental change in socio-technical systems. What I'm talking about is making another deep transition, a severing of our reliance on fossil fuels in order to achieve a more sustainable future for ourselves and future generations. What we might th then think about is uh, what role innovation policy can play in helping to make a more sustainable future. <clears throat> Do we have the knowledge needed to make a second deep transition? If we admit that we do not, and I do not believe that we do, uh, then how can technology and innovation policy, as well as other policies, be mobilized to tackle the needs? Uh, Johann Schott and myself uh, wrote uh, a paper, uh, Three Frames for Innovation Policy, which uh, reviews the different framings or uh, objectives of policy uh, from the past to the present. And what we argue is that there is an emerging third frame. I'll get to that in just a moment. But if we think of the first frame, many of you will encounter this as <coughs> the linear model. Okay. Uh, the linear model uh, uh, is uh, a kind of pipeline in which if we invest more money in science, we get more useful knowledge, which is then applicable uh, to human betterment and human needs. Okay. So from that perspective, if you think that that is the really the accurate description, the predominant the description that we need to understand the world, then uh, addressing sustainability goals is a matter of putting more money into the pipe so that we get more useful outputs at the end. That will give us more choice, more alternatives, more solutions, more possibilities uh, for the future. However, uh, this frame has had some disappointments. One of them is that there's only a modest correlation uh, between the amount that any given country invests in science and its ability to make progress towards a higher level of social and economic development. Uh, Related to this is that uh, less advanced economies uh, have been frustrated uh, by uh, the promise that's made by frame one thinking that once that knowledge is produced, it's available everywhere. And uh, if it's available everywhere, then what explains why some countries are very far behind uh, other countries in terms of the utilization of the knowledge. It must be some kind of failure 
of technology transfer or worse. Okay? It may have implications about uh, corruption or mismanagement uh, or other very pejorative kinds of ideas about why uh, the country is unable to take advantage of this common pool of knowledge. Third, uh, the results from frame one uh, have created major social problems as well as advances, as well as improvements. So science uh, uh, creates monsters as well as benefits. Perhaps most importantly, frame one uh, is a very indirect way of addressing the social needs and existential threats that I spoke about earlier. And uh, as it is constituted, it is a way for existing elites, existing actors who wish to have business as usual uh, to capture uh, <coughs> the policies, to capture the direction of investment, and not to make the kind of fundamental changes uh, that are required. So frame one thinking uh, has problems. However, frame one uh, nevertheless is useful because we need to have a greater stock of knowledge even if not everyone can equally exploit it and develop it, uh, it still uh, is a long-term benefit for humankind. Well, frame two kind of thinking, uh, often referred to as uh, national systems of innovation, or from that the broader idea of systems of innovation, said that it's not only a problem of market failure, the absence of incentives of private actors to invest in the creation of science and therefore the necessity of government, but also the pro problem that uh, there may be underdeveloped or dysfunctional links horizontally and vertically between all of the actors that are necessary to bring innovations into life. These <coughs> breakdowns can be thought of as system failures. Now, a key motivation for frame two was the desire uh, to perform in an increasingly globalized world in a more effective and competitive way. And there has been some success in applying frame two thinking to improving competitiveness. Like frame one, however, frame two uh, indicates that the regulation of scientific and technical advance should be only undertaken uh, when problems become apparent. So the style is ex post regulation uh, of uh, possible problems or better problems that can be demonstrated. Uh, we can think about, for example, how long it took uh, before uh, cigarettes uh, were actually seriously constrained by regulation <clears throat> and how in many countries of the world the state tobacco monopolies are still actively promoting uh, people's smoking even though this will cause serious health problems in the future. Of course, it will reduce the social security payments as well in those, some of those countries. Frame two's focus on competitiveness and, uh, and development conceived as economic growth diverts attention uh, from social needs. This is a strong statement, uh, certainly a contestable one, because some people that believe in the frame two approach say, 
No, we have not ignored uh, social needs. Uh, uh, that's a matter for uh, political decision making in the allocation of resources within the system. Okay. But in that sense, there is a good deal of similarity between frame one and frame two. Uh, the social needs and purposes are externalized to the management from the management of science and technology and made part of another system, a political system. So what is frame three? <clears throat> like frame two, frame three is a response to the historically prior uh, way of thinking. Frame three thinking focuses directly on social needs and challenges. It's based on the belief that frame one and two are not themselves adequate to achieve the needed deep transition or to adequately address other social goals such as the sustainable development goals. Now, there is much debate to be had uh, about the word adequate in this context, okay? Because adequacy has much to do with uh, political will, uh, desire, uh, and consensus within the society uh, to address uh, particular needs. And uh, perhaps we'll come to that uh, in a few moments. Uh, but uh, frame three thinking seeks to identify and utilize methods for more inclusive decision making to bring all parts of society along with the transition. Why is this significant? Because both frames one and frames two are essentially managed by and key decisions are taken by a technocratic elite. Julian. So, hi, thanks Ed. Are you saying that mission oriented policies are compatible with frame three thinking? Well, they could be. Uh, it's a really a question of what in practice mission-oriented policies amount to. Okay? So in the first instance, uh, if we think about mission-oriented policies of the past, for example, the United States determination uh, to put a man on the moon, okay, uh, then uh, it's definitely true uh, that uh, a technocratic elite took all the relevant decisions. Okay. There weren't other people consulted. Uh, and it was only because uh, it was seen as a matter of national prestige that other people in the society were able to go along with the idea, uh, helped by the fact that the person who announced the goal was shot and killed uh, 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 not very long after he announced the promise. So it became a kind of memorial uh, as well. But it's those kinds of things that uh, really shape uh, uh, mission-oriented policies of the past. Now, mission-oriented policies have become uh, a key uh, buzzword uh, within policy circles of late. Uh, and what it remains to be seen uh, is whether the processes that are established uh, have the same uh, capture of the process by uh, the technocratic elites or whether in some way they are more democratic and inclusive uh, than the policies of the past. Okay. So the answer could be, okay, remains to be seen, uh, has some significant risks associated with it because of past experience and models uh, for managing and running mission-oriented research. Frame three thinking also uh, seeks uh, means to anticipate problems ex ante or in the process of research and development. Uh, frame three thinking has a critical edge, much as I expressed in the answer to your question, uh, being very suspicious 
of incumbents and co-optation, the possibility of being redirected towards ex existing interests and existing uh, powers. Frame three prioritizes human flourishing, which is a very mm, uh, somewhat grandiose term, uh, which means uh, uh, basically that people uh, see themselves as having a better life. And we know that people seeing themselves as having a better life is only loosely correlated with having more money in their pocket. There are lots of other determinants of whether people feel that they have a better life or not. So we're not necessarily about maximizing uh, productivity or maximizing economic growth, okay? not denying that, that there are, those issues are significant, but pursuit of those goals to the exclusion of others that are consistent with human flourishing may not be productive for human flourishing. So this idea of frame three thinking may seem somewhat provisional. And in fact, uh, you'll see uh, that there are some open ends, uh, some need for further development, uh, because frame three thinking is relatively new. It's really an attempt uh, to more formalize uh, things that are bubbling up uh, through social movements and social innovation and people that are trying to make a difference uh, in the world with regard to sustainability and other social goals. Okay? It's a way to theorize and think about how those activities are related to traditional thinking about innovation, science, and technology policy. So now let's talk about uh, uh, problems of uncertainty uh, and directionality. Because I'm sure that many of you may have arrived at this point in the talk uh, and had a feeling a little bit like uh, uh, the two guys to the blackboard with some mathematics, and in the middle, uh, the caption is, then a miracle occurs, okay? And the caption at the bottom the, uh, is, I think you should be more explicit here uh, in step two, uh, the one in which the miracle happens. So frame three is based upon a theory of social change. So there are many theories of social change. Uh, frame three is based upon an idea called the multi-level perspective, or if you prefer, multi-level perspective. So this perspective views society as having three fundamental structures in it. Uh, one structure is the landscape. The landscape is the set of rules, norms, social customs, culture, laws that apply uh, to activities within the society. It also encompasses, the landscape also encompasses social opinion. So what is viewed as a normal thing? we often refer to as social norms. <clears throat> that landscape uh, then typically reinforces the reproduction and continuation of particular ways of doing things. What Nelson and Winter would refer to as organizational routines and what socio-technical scholars, uh, transition scholars, see as regimes within uh, society. So the regime uh, is a ordering of actors, uh, purposes, and methods uh, 
that tends to be reproduced over time and uh, reinforced over time uh, into a pattern of incumbency. And the problem here is that incumbent regime is often incompatible with making a deep transition. But at a more basic level, if we think about how fundamental change occurs in society, <clears throat> it's a question of how alternatives percolate from small to large, how they are replicated, uh, spread, uh, economists would like the word diffused, uh, how they circulate uh, within society from an initial instance, uh, a localized context, uh, more broadly. Okay. Until the point that they may challenge the existing regime. What we call those bubbles, the percolation bubbles that change the regime, we call those niches. Okay. So, uh, it's not obvious uh, or certain that a niche can exist because the incumbent ways of doing things are very powerful. Okay. You want to make a steam-powered automobile? Yeah, well, maybe you can. Uh, uh, and maybe you can sell it to two or three hundred people. So there's a problem here, okay, that uh, niches have uh, a lot of resistances and barriers to overcome if they are to replace the existing uh, regime. And we'd like to put things in pictures, uh, and this is the picture that we come up with uh, in uh, depicting the process of social change in the multi-level perspective. The MLP, the multi-level perspective, suggests that change occurs when there are pressures on the existing regime uh, from the landscape and when niches are able to become aligned to create a new configuration. What does that mean? Well, uh, in London, I live beside the Thames. And it's fortunate that I lived beside the Thames in 2019 and not some earlier century. Because in an earlier century, the Thames was a sewer. Okay. And the place in London where I lived uh, was the Docklands. Uh, and in the Docklands, there were piles and piles of manure with all the things that come with manure. <clears throat> Regimes had to change in order for that place that I live in uh, to be a fair place to live. Okay. Now, I'm not implying that the changes were made in order to accommodate my uh, lifestyle. Uh, but uh, fortunately, they were made because uh, people resisted uh, the existing regime and because alternatives were available. Okay. Similarly, if I had lived there during the 1960s, uh, it would have been very punishing. Air quality is not really good as it is, better alongside the river, but London air quality uh, in the 50s and the 60s was still very much <laughs> shaped uh, by coal consumption. Okay? And the famous London fog was largely pollution. Okay? So what happened in those various regimes that I've mentioned, uh, horse-drawn carriage, okay? uh, the idea uh, of uh, public sanitation, okay? so uh, the question of how sanitation is organized, and uh, the question of how uh, energy is generated, uh, were all systems that have changed in the last century. Okay? 
They've changed through this process uh, of an incumbent regime which was merrily reproducing itself from generation to generation, coming under pressure from the uh, regime, from the landscape, from the people's ideas about how uh, the world should be, and from pressure from below from alternatives that were offered to the existing regime. The combination of the two uh, is the powerful uh, instrument by which uh, change is occurring. Paloma. Um, thank you. Can you tell us uh, what those little arrows represent in the graph? These arrows here uh, are niches which aren't necessarily going anywhere. Okay? There's a steam automobile uh, uh, at the period in which the regime of the petrol and diesel fueled automobile uh, taking control of the mobility regime. <clears throat> These arrows, the red ones, uh, are an indication uh, that some of those niches have been selected out uh, as being able to actively contest the existing incumbent regime. And because they're becoming more aligned with it, there's a real possibility that they'll simply be co-opted within it. Okay? There's no necessity uh, that uh, they replace it. Okay? They may be included within it by some adaptation. On the other hand, they may represent a significant enough departure that there is really uh, an alternative regime uh, which is very different than the past. And so as we move from the left to the right, which is a movement in time, uh, we're uh, developing a new configuration, whether it be uh, a configuration that involves the co-optation or the replacement uh, of the prior regime. One more idea about uncertainty and directionality here. Uh, this is really the same kind of diagram as I had a moment ago. It's another way to understand regime change, which is more schematic. It separates out uh, two ideas. One is that <clears throat> uh, the routines uh, represent rules or ways of doing things. So if I have a rule uh, such as make things with no attention uh, to recycling. So make things to throw away. Okay. Uh, uh, that may change. Okay. People may observe we're using more and more and more and more of our land as landfill. Okay. Uh, and that interferes with our food security. Uh, landfill sites uh, leach pollution into the uh, groundwater and so forth and so on. Uh, we may uh, come to resist uh, and, in fact, find uh, society to be too wasteful. And the rule uh, uh, might uh, change to make things be recyclable or reusable. It might become a social norm. You're only willing to buy things that are recyclable or reusable. People are forced to produce things that are recyclable or reusable by law. A variety of possible ways uh, to get there, uh, but those ways uh, amount to external pressure for change, which has the effect of, on the stable, dominant socio-technical regime of eroding it and making it unstable. So a movement from the upper right-hand corner in which the stability of the rules is high and the percentage of population using the rules is also high towards uh, a low stability of the rules and a declining number of people 
that are using those rules. But then it's quite important that there be some alternative, okay? That someone actually be making things that are recyclable or reusable, okay? And that comes out of the niches that we saw in the previous uh, diagram. And those niches evolved to offer an alternative to the regime. And as they evolve, as in the red arrows in the uh, previous diagram, they converge and align in a way that makes them possible substitutes in which we can have a wide breakthrough and the uh, regime uh, grows to be the new regime, the new stable dominant uh, regime. So this is the theory of social change. Uh, you see that it emphasizes the significance of niches, of eruptions of novelty and change, their incorporation and embedding through a process of uh, competition aided by uh, external pressures with the possibility uh, that uh, those uh, uh, niches might be embedded or inside the existing regime merely as reforms. So finally, here on the underlying uh, theory, uh, there is the question uh, and the use of the word uh, directionality. Uh, this is a favorite word of my colleague uh, Andy Sterling, and I think is a very well-chosen uh, uh, word to speak about uh, the path that technology uh, takes over time, because it not only incorporates the fact that we know from research uh, that much of technical change is incremental, occurs in small steps, and builds upon uh, the immediate past achievements, and therefore uh, has a degree of predictability to it, uh, but also that that uh, incremental process describes a trajectory uh, that has a direction. And that direction for most of the history of the after the first deep transition was increasing energy intensity. So once upon a time, uh, uh, there was uh, a very modest use of energy uh, on the farm because uh, energy uh, meant human and animal labor. Uh, then we have mechanization of agriculture. Then we have artificial fertilizers, which are produced through energy intensive processes. We have further chemical additives, uh, which further uh, use energy uh, in the production of food. And all of this has a benefit, uh, which is uh, more and cheaper food, uh, but it also has a cost in terms of the sustainability uh, of the agricultural system. <clears throat> so if we talk about that process across many socio-technical systems, we can see uh, a series of uh, eruptions uh, which could be uh, thought of as surges uh, in uh, productivity and output. Uh, so one of these, for example, is the uh, surge in the use of petroleum rather than coal. And another might be the use of natural gas rather than petroleum. Okay. They're all following along uh, this trajectory that was established in the first deep transition. At the same time, we have a collection of arrows again. Okay, uh, These niches that are going in different directions, some of them more aligned with the existing energy intensive use, some of them less aligned. <clears throat> and if there is to be a second deep transition, those arrows have to accumulate and become more aligned so that they can influence the development of a new trajectory, a new path, uh, a new direction.
That's the underlying theory. Now I'm going to turn uh, to the issue of how policy might address the world that we live in using a kind of frame three thinking. How do we actually make relevant policy in that world? Well, if we take on frame three thinking, then the foundations of transformative innovation policy must acknowledge the need for inclusivity. Why am I so keen on inclusivity and why am I so hostile towards uh, technocratic elites? Well, you may have observed around the world uh, or in your own society uh, that uh, all is not well uh, with regard to social cohesion. And it's not merely a matter of income distribution. It's a matter of the degree of understanding and agreement uh, with the agenda for the future, for imaginary for the future. Okay. Is it imaginary for the future in which you have uh, a smaller chance of becoming very wealthy than you do of winning the lottery. Of course, if you're in the right lottery, you might become very wealthy. <clears throat> but this very small chance of social advancement is a problem. Uh, 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 and uh, not only, uh, but the feeling that uh, we once did valuable things, things that were valued by a society, things that were valued by each other, things that were valued within our communities, we're no longer able to do those things. Yeah. This is the impact of globalization. Other people are doing those things now. now some people say, uh, say well, okay, uh, so I'm not sure I really wanted to be uh, an automobile factory worker. It was certainly an opportunity available to me as a young person. Okay. I have friends who spent their entire lives as automobile factory workers. Okay. But uh, there are equally many more people from my generation said, I don't think the automobile industry has a great future. I'm going to go and find some other activity, some other pursuit uh, that uh, I can do that has a greater chance uh, of stability and long-term opportunity. And those of us that pursued that path actually found, well, there wasn't just one thing because the whole world was changing uh, and you had to do many different things. So it was much more about gathering a portfolio of skills and capabilities than it was pursuing a career. In any case, we were more adaptable and flexible to those changes than those that we left behind. But those who left behind became uh, a problem. Now, here we have uh, uh, also, uh, the question of uncertainty, okay? Uh, and with regard to uncertainty, we have uncertainty about how niche development uh, will occur and whether it will be a successful replacement for the incumbent uh, regime. Uh, and we have the possibility for transformative change within the existing regime that I mentioned uh, just a moment ago. And finally, we have the resistance of existing regimes to transformation. All of these things are things that we need to acknowledge in thinking about uh, policy. So what that, these things imply is that we need to work to anticipate or imagine uh, future opportunities and developments. Um, so. So you're talking about that, okay, we, we have a lot of, uh, we have fundamental uncertainties about, you know, um, about niche developments and scientific advances. 
So in such circumstances, how do you then anticipate um, a second deep transition or, or the kind of technological developments that you're talking about? It's very difficult to anticipate the second deep transition. Okay, uh, We don't know, uh, just as much as we don't have a blueprint for it, Okay, we don't even have a concept sketch for it. Okay, All we can say is it will be more sustainable uh, than our current system. Okay. So, but we do know that we will have to make changes in existing socio-technical systems. So we can look in those socio-technical systems, look at the trajectory that they're on, and that's what I mean by anticipation. Okay, Look at the alternatives, uh, look to see whether they really offer uh, an alternative uh, that is more sustainable. Imagine their future development as a possibility or potential and weigh a existing versus alternative developments in order to come up with a bias or direction in the policies that we establish. So that's what we mean by anticipation, processes of anticipation. And yes, that's uh, a useful place for a technocratic elite to participate, but it's also a useful site, a uh, useful activity for ordinary people to participate in because they experience these developments, they're part of the society in which they're embedded, they're part of, they should be included as well in attempting to anticipate future developments. And finally, a willingness to engage in conflict, uh, a struggle at a political level, uh, because there will be resistances uh, there will be barriers, uh, there will be blockages uh, to attempts uh, to change. The existing regime reproduces itself and by virtue of doing that accumulates substantial power and by power I mean coercive force often backed by the state which in many societies have a monopoly on the use of lethal force don't underestimate uh, the extent uh, to which struggle uh, can uh, become very difficult. So many people that we're attempting to address are either presently or will in the future uh, be involved uh, as policy makers or advisors to policy makers. And so for them, a key question is at a programmatic or project level, uh, transform what does transformative innovation policy mean? <clears throat> Well, first, remember, we don't have a blueprint. So what we need is experimentation. We need to uh, try things out to develop these different anticipations of the future, different understandings of possibilities, uh, in order to assess alternatives with a particular attention, and this is what we're taking from frame two, to the cumulative learning about the domains in which the experiments are lodged. Second, we need new means of evaluation uh, that are not completely captured by the audit culture, the value for money, uh, the uh, return on investment, uh, but that are oriented towards uh, improving the learning from the experiment so that you can do better the next time when you know more. And we need uh, to uh, develop human capabilities uh, uh, to anticipate, experiment, and evaluate. Here it's important to note that you don't have to start with a clean sheet of paper. 
that projects that are not transformation-led can be stretched to have greater transformative potential. And some particular criteria for selecting sites or project opportunities uh, are included in this next slide. Uh, this uh, is a, a slide developed earlier in our work. Uh, and these six criteria or categories are uh, provisional in nature. They're subject to revision uh, and development. But these are ideas that we think are relevant for thinking about changing directionality uh, and improving the transformational potential of projects. To think explicitly about directionality, that what social goal you're addressing, the system level impact of the experiment or project or program, uh, the possibilities for learning and reflexivity, the ability to critically reflect upon uh, what you have uh, experienced. Uh, <clears throat> the question, are you just going with the flow or are you actually taking some exception uh, with uh, the way things are, the business as usual, and inclusiveness? Who exactly are you excluding and who are you including? in this process. And if you think about all of those as uh, kinds of weights to look at uh, in selecting uh, a project or program, or indeed in trying to stretch an existing project or program to have more transformative potential, then I would argue uh, that these are good starting points. But they can be improved, and we intend to. Now, in the final chapter, I'm going to tell you about uh, Tipsy. So the title of this talk was uh, A Journey Through Transformative Innovation Policy. Uh, and it's been my great uh, pleasure to be involved in a very innovative uh, and uh, uh, ambitious uh, effort uh, to bring uh, transformative innovation policy from uh, our author desks uh, of the researcher uh, into actual practice uh, in the world. Uh, and we've been very fortunate in this regard uh, to uh, find people who are willing to get together uh, to form uh, the Transformative Innovation Policy Consortium or TIPSY for short. Yeah. TIPSY is international, as you can see by the map, uh, and uh, there are seven uh, members of uh, TIPSY, uh, six of whom are founding members. Subsequently, Mexico has joined. And we also have six associate members. Some, like China, are unable to participate in the administrative structure uh, uh, that we have for TIPSY. Others uh, are not in a position to contribute the resources that we require uh, for a full uh, membership or are at an early stage of their involvement. So all in all, there are 13 different organizations involved in this activity. Chantal. Thank you, Ed. It's very exciting to see the members and associates so widely distributed around the world. But I noticed from the slides that most of the members and associates are science and funding agencies. Can you explain a little why that's the case? <coughs> we usually say, uh, and to be honest with you, it's a little bit objectionable, uh, that this is a coalition of the willing. Okay. Uh, these uh, are organizations that have the means uh, uh, to contribute to a common resource pool for running the consortium, uh, for engaging activities, have the ability uh, to put policies into place, and have uh, a, a, a need or a demand for engaging with a different way to approach innovation policy because they take sustainable development goals very seriously, because they think that 
the existing ways of thinking and managing uh, follow models like fund and forget, which is a kind of frame one thinking, or uh, manage uh, networks uh, in order to uh, improve linkages, uh, but that's not directly addressing uh, the social needs and it's too complicated to explain to other policymakers. Uh, or some other reason, uh, they think that something new is required. And for them, uh, the appeal of frame three thinking is that we're tackling social needs uh, issues quite uh, directly rather than expecting it to come indirectly through improved economic growth, productivity, uh, or just a larger stock of knowledge to apply to problems. Okay. We're engaged in a, after having had a fairly successful initial pilot year, uh, we're now engaged in a five-year program uh, uh, amongst the consortium members uh, which involves uh, activities in those domains that I identified earlier of evaluation, uh, uh, policy experimentation, training skills and capabilities. And at the end of the day, uh, uh, we're not doing this as a consultancy activity. We have an interest in research uh, and knowledge co-production. So in other words, we want to participate with the members of the consortium in documenting and producing uh, knowledge about uh, this approach. Uh, uh, and where it works, where it doesn't work, where it's useful, where it doesn't have a use, uh, uh, how it encounters barriers and how those barriers are overcome or accommodated to, all of those become grist for the research. Uh, process. <clears throat> and one can also think about this as being supported uh, by a process of networking uh, to achieve impact which requires communication and engagement. TIPSI is meant to be a, a coordination uh, of those activities with this band around here, the country specific implementation projects being the specific sites of experimentation and uh, learning uh, that we will be engaging with uh, during the five-year uh, program. What next? We have some videos. This video will be one of them. Uh, uh, we can uh, have uh, further readings at the website. Uh, we're on Twitter, and I thank you very much.